Any other question? Okay. Um, for uh, there's actually a question for for both uh, Dr. Shana and Dr. Anim. Um, in in theological education, uh, I think there are a lot of factors working in. Um, I, I've seen a tendency of um, ministers in Africa going to study overseas and then often staying there rather than coming back to to bring what they've learned uh, back to to the communities. Um, you've got the tendency of of um, residential education becoming really prohibitive, prohibitively expensive and, and online becoming um, more prominent. And then also, um, uh, you have a situation where the center of gravity of Christianity has moved from the, from the north to the south, but where the center of gravity of theological training is still very much in the north and the west. So I just want to hear what, what your um, views are on, on what can practically be done to move that center of gravity southward towards Africa and, and, and the global south um, bec because it just seems to me that theological training, I mean, you, you need a lot of time to build up a track record and credibility for an institution. So, uh, so how would that practically look? Any other question? Robert? Um, my question will be for both of the buffundis. Uh, you are talking about that we should look we our world view of the pentecostal must be based in africa in our african world view yet we are saying that we have got our population of christian is increasing up to 631 which means you will be soon evangelizing the other part of the world and are we going to imply the same thing that the european applied when they came to South Africa that the worldview was like an European worldview. So if we concentrate on our worldview, how are we going to impact the other world? Are we going to take our worldview and take it to Europe, America, and so on? Any other question? Maybe what we'll do is uh, maybe these, let's use these, f these four questions as a way of kick-starting the discussions and the conversation. Right. I will do what I can, and what I can't, I will leave it to the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> that is why you're here. And, and I don't want any comment from him. <laughs> Everything is overruled in advance. <laughs> so he understands our language. Now... <laughs> Um, let's see how it goes. I really enjoyed his present presentation. Now, are we going to export our worldview issues about mission? Are we going to make the same mistakes? I think there's an important principle that we need to understand anytime we read the Bible. It's a missiological principle. We learn principles from the Bible, but not so much of practices. The reason is that there are principles informing the practices. And once you pick the principle, you can apply them in different contexts. I hope you understand. I'll try and unpack that. So usually what happens is that um, if, if you take for God so loved the world, what is the principle behind it? And how is this love expressed? You realize that different people express love in different ways. And the content, the context also give meaning to actually the test as well. So let's say that um, uh, in Africa, um, we love to praise the Lord, worship, shout, you know, dance around, scream. The microphone, everything is on top, basically making us deaf, but we don't mind. You know, it doesn't mean that when you go to Britain or England, you are going to tune all the musical instruments at that high level. Nobody will come the following Sunday. And you don't go and say that this is how we do it back home, and therefore this is how I'm going to do it. It's music you are interested in, but not breaking the eardrums. So if your eardrum is such that it can contain a certain level of uh, um, sound or noise, it doesn't mean that everyone else should buy into that. That is not to talk about the fact that it is not even healthy. 
to start with. But assuming that that is good for you, what you're interested in is that you want, they must celebrate, them, there's a need for a music, but how they want it in the form of, uh, of a hymn or this and that, you know, you leave it to them. When early missionaries came to Ghana, for example, um, let's take it the Methodist Presbyterians, they brought a lot of, basically a replica of what they were having in their, you know, the hymns and the organs. And the, but back home, you play the hymns and the organ, everybody falls asleep. You know, but then you bring hallelujah, shout, you know, they sing, they do the drums, the percussion, rather than the, the organ. doesn't mean that they don't like it, but they connect more with that. So in that sense, what is contextually appropriate and appreciable, there's nothing wrong with that. So the point I'm trying to say is that you must not export your worldview. And we must separate the gospel message from the cultural clothing, you know, that comes with it. And that is a task that we all need to, to do. Um, I quite remember, uh, let's take the Lord's Supper, for example. Initially, Pentecostal started the Lord's Supper using bread, right? As in piece of bread. And then they'll break it and then share. And then we were castigating the Roman Catholics and Anglicans for using the, the wafer. And now we are even using the wafer more than yeah. they are using it. Yeah. Mm. The same applies to the clerical color. Early Pentecostals would not use it. They were using Thai. Now we use it more than they do. Mm. I hope you understand. So th these are things that you don't have to fight over them. In the sense that the, I don't see them as the primary issues. The gospel message non-negotiable. We must understand what it is. But its expression can take different forms as to what makes sense and meaningful in a particular context. So the, the bottom line is that don't export your worldview. However, your worldview is also significant in engaging. And I'm saying that this is where we have a problem. You know, when my brother was talking, he made uh, reference to the fact that because we have not been able to think through a lot of our theology and the things we do, it is giving rise to all kinds of disturbing practices, all in the name of the church. And this is forcing governments to put in regulations. I am not for the regulations, but I'm signing a warning that if we don't clean our houses, they would do that for us, and that would not be the best. That's the point I'm trying to make, that we are giving cause for that. Something happened in, in Ghana, uh, and I hear even in South Africa there were some disturbing issues. Uh, a charismatic minister, whether he was doing deliverance or whatever it was, basically pulled down a lady's underpant with the idea that the Holy Spirit will get into her quicker or something like that. Can you imagine that? You see, you can easily, you know, blacklist them, but they do that in the name of Pentecostalism. So it's becoming very, very difficult. And if such people don't also receive help, the casualties will just continue and continue and continue. Uh, one would just step on a pregnant woman in church, you know, trying to cast out something. It's so bizarre. And you wonder what kind of Bible they open. Yeah. And the sad thing is that people also flock to these areas. But I'll tell you something. A lot of what happens in our prophetic ministry, so to speak, they are not too different from what happens in their traditional shrines. They have repackaged themselves and come. And so if we don't really work out our theology very well, <laughs> we would be taken hostage by some of these disturbing things. And I think we must rise up and address the issue. Not so much of complaining, but trying to tackle. If it means offering training and resources to deal with this, we must do that. I think discipleship is also very much lacking. You know, people come to faith and just, we just leave them. You know, uh, discipleship actually brings character out and helps us to engage in a more transformative and creative, uh, productive way in the society in which we live. Um, I, will, I will leave you, if you want to add to it, and then we can just... Okay, thank you for that wonderful answer. Uh, I think in terms of uh, African context, I always think that it's like an album. Find your picture in the album. Don't tear out the pictures of others. You, know? you are in the Bible. Find your picture there but don't destroy the pictures of others. Because uh, I think that the contextual relevance must not lose the integrity of identity. Okay? So the contextual, uh, God accepts all of us, how we express ourselves. The problem that has come is that all along, everything that was African was inferior, or everything that was African was demonic. 
one of the things that made me not go to Bible school was the first year I was in Bible school, everything African was demonic. And I, and I had a problem because only demons, strongholds of demons were in Africa. They were not in Japan. They were not in America. And I had a problem with that because I thought there were more demons in Japan and India than Africa. Why? So, so I, I think it's just, this is what we are just saying, that find your, your picture in the album, uh, but you don't have to destroy the pictures of others. I like what uh, my brother said. I think what you need to do is not to export your Africanness or your African identity, but exploit it where you are. Don't necessarily export it, but exploit it where you are. There are many good things that are African that are biblical also. Where there are Af African things that are cultural, not biblical, we'll, we will apply the biblical uh, principles to the uh, Pentecostals are more pneumatologically numa, inclined than others, uh, but we should say more and not, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think there might be a, maybe a slip of the tongue that we are not the others. We're not saying that necessarily others are not spiritual, but we are saying there is a greater emphasis on um, one of the things, debates that we had in the Evangelical Alliance, for instance, was that m many of the spirit-filled churches talk about spirit-filled uh, experience and power and very little about Jesus. You know, so that worries us. You know, uh, so uh, thank, you for, thank you for that balance. Regulation of churches. Um, let me give you the Zimbabwean experience. In Zimbabwe, there was a proliferation of false churches and all. And, and of course, we were going through a political situation and there were some outspoken. And so the government wanted to regulate the church for a number of reasons. We went back to the church, to the government, and we proposed three things. First and foremost, we are not for regulation. Uh, I think the church should never, uh, even if it, you are trying to stop false prophets, regulation is medicine that is more dangerous than the disease. You know, so I think what we need to do is to be, uh, to have an integrity of principle. If there's freedom of worship, it means people have a right to be wrong. It means if want somebody wanted to worship a cat or the hind leg of, of a cat, the constitution says they have that right, okay? However, I think what is important is to be able to bring to bear the influence of the church on government's thinking, which is what we did in Zimbabwe. What we did, first of all, is to self-regulate. So we proposed a code of ethics and conduct for ourselves. And we said to the government, we will regulate ourselves. Don't regulate us. Okay? Then we said, if you really find that a difficult thing to do, we will ask for statutory self-regulation. In other words, you put a statute there that says we, we are entitled to regulate, but it's our people that are regulating us. Because anywhere else in the world, Lawyers regulate lawyers. Doctors regulate doctors. There is no premier or waiver who regulates another sector. So we said that's the way we go. If you feel that it's imperative for you to regulate us, then we would like to be regulated as the church, not as a religious conglomerate with Baha'i, Islam, and so on. So I, I, I think for us, it, we wanted non-regulation. However, what Dr. Anim is saying is very important. If the church does not apply self-discipline and self-censorship, somebody is going to do it for you. And it's better for you to do it than to let someone else say. So um, center of gravity, uh, minister studying and staying overseas, and the center of gravity shifting. First of all, I, I think one of the th changes we are seeing in the 21st century is that uh, biblical um, uh, training is moving from residential to virtual and maybe even to uh, partnered or mentored. And I think that the Pentecostal theological institutions need to factor that in their thinking. You know? And so I think that you, you got a point there. The center of gravity um, might is a transition, and so you cannot have an abrupt move. I think what we need to do is develop collaborations and synergies that transfer uh, capacities, uh, resources, or maybe even share. These days with technology, you can do that. Uh, in the economic world, they're do, they doing what they call technological and knowledge transfer. I think in the church, we could get into those arrangements where we are working with established 
um, uh, campuses or institutions, but we are uh, gradually transferring technology and knowledge to ourselves. Otherwise, we will always be... Um, I also think that we need to start the journey of building our own indigenous capacities. It's a journey. It, it might not look as good now, but in the next decade, we will get to a place where we have our own people. We've got to start somewhere. So I, I don't think we should necessarily be afraid to start because it might not look as good as, as, the, as the rest. Uh, and of course, we can always utilize modern technology. Thank you. I just want to give a, just a comment on regulation just to explain the South African experience. I think some of us, we are part of the churches that were summoned to the CRL Commission in South Africa. Uh, it's a commission that is there to oversee practices that are happening, whether it's culture or religious. Now, when Dr. Shana speaks about self-regulation, self-regulation is when the church or the churches or religion regulates itself in how it expresses and practices its freedom of religion. Now, the problem with us in South Africa is that the people who are causing problems are the people who are not self-regulating. They don't have any umbrella body they are accountable to. Somebody just comes and declares themselves an apostle or a prophet, put a tent somewhere or hire a hall somewhere, and both of them f from within South Africa and from outside of South Africa. And nobody knows who they are, who ordained them, so they are accountable to nobody. So the things that came to the CR commissions, that when the churches that were there, including ourselves and denominational churches, they were asking specific questions from which they requested documentation. If you say you are self-regulating, can we see your constitution? The constitution will indicate the structure of the church that shows church governance. That church is not a one-man show. That church has succession plan. Church is run in a way where there is separation between church as a public benefit organization and the pastor's personal life. Because in South Africa, every church must be registered as a church. That is not a business. It is just a church. So people will register churches as companies and they are the sole beneficiaries of those churches. So that's where the problems were. So now there's a danger now that the same commission is going to be a reverie and a player at the same time. That is going to come with laws that limit our religious freedom. You know why are they doing that? Because they're saying there's lots of people who are coming with harmful religious practices. Giving people petrol, snakes, and so forth. People are embezzling the church's money. Enriching themselves in the name of the church. People are accountable to nobody. That's where the problems are. Not only that, people are violating bylaws. I started a church in flats. At 11 o'clock when people are supposed to be studying, doing assignments, our sound system is blaring loud and we are disturbing the peace. These are the things that are happening. So it means we don't have law and order, or there are some people who don't have law and order. Those are the th issues we are dealing with. So there's, there's even more. But the issue is, if we don't self-regulate, as we claim to self-regulate, then we're going to have the issue of separation between the church and the state violated, and the church is going to take over. The, 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 the state is going to take over the church, thank you, sir, and run the church, and determine the qualifications of the pastor because nobody should tell the church how they qualify to become a pastor because we are tempering on dangerous territory. I just wanted to give that context so that we may understand. Yeah, just a quick word on this. Uh, you've done well by helping us to understand the seriousness and the depth of the problem. But I'm not hearing much about the solution. And I think we need to move beyond that. We have a problem. We need an answer. We shouldn't spend all the time discussing the problems. Otherwise, it will be too late. The bottom line is this. 
this thing was coming and somehow, some way, we were playing ostriches. And now it is getting out of hand. Government has overall responsibility for civic society. And therefore, see, the point is that it is easier to blame the government when you're not doing your work well. So let's take, for example, uh, in Ghana, I think when we had the revolution, Rollins type, there was a time when they asked that all churches must register. But at that time, we were smelling something. So we, the churches quickly mobilized and tried to fight it. But there was some good thing about it. Here is it. Um, the churches, all churches register, isn't it? But then you must register with the constitution and then there were certain standards that were expected. So those who couldn't meet them had to collaborate or be part of particular churches and operate under the umbrella. And I didn't see anything wrong with that. You see, the Christian community is one of the most divided communities. You know, on theological lines and all kinds of lines. We are the evangelical Pentecostal days. We are this. I mean, I don't want to go there. But if you are the classical Pentecostal, you define it, come together. If you are spiritual churches, come together. You know, if you are mainline, you come together. Whatever you want to call yourself. And then you tell us, give us something that you want to use to regulate. Are you with me? And then we give this to the government. So that at least somebody is accountable. The government wouldn't step in. You yourself would take, you know. So if somebody is asking somebody to chew snakes or grass, then there is a body that must be held responsible. And they can discipline the person or withdraw their license. Yeah. So I, I, I personally am worried that because governments, by virtue of their history, anytime you hear government, then you, you cringe. It's like nothing good will come out of them. But let's work with government at this point because it could be very, very serious. Yeah. But if we don't, they will step in. And they may have a good case to step in. And when they do, it will not be in our interest. The church will be over-politicized and it could create more serious problems. So I share your concerns. It's happening in Ghana. It's happening in Nigeria. I see some kind of wave blowing. It's just happening all around. And it's very, very disturbing. You know, you can't do it in the name of God and freedom of religion and get away with it. it it's just not acceptable. So we are with you, but when you find answers, share them with us. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, on, on that, uh, perhaps with the South African con uh, delegation, we could share a few. One of the things we suggested to the government was we are self-regulated and we get there's no person that belongs to the association that doesn't have a constitution that doesn't subscribe to. But we said to, to them, I think what you need to do is to uh, speak to the other groups to do what Dr. Arnim said. Let them come into a conglomeration. If they don't, then permits, uh, accommodation, and all those other things will be applicable. I also do think, though, that uh, the church may be waking up too late to these issues. Uh, as a lawyer, of course, there is always a loophole. What the um, CRL and any of the other commissions want to do in the, in the world can be contested constitutionally. But that is, then you antagonize government. So I think the best thing is, is to preempt that yourselves and then you regulate. Yeah, I think one of the challenges also, just, just to, to, to make a loop on this, I think the challenge in South Africa is that those who are complying, who are self-regulating, there's a minority that is not regulated. Now, one of the suggestions was that a government must enact and enforce the laws that are there. But the problem is we don't want to throw our Christian brothers under the bus, but they are already under the bus. <laughs> I just wanted to speak to, to the solutions. Uh, in the midst of the problem, we have been working on solutions as well. The Evangelical Alliance of South Africa and a number of other partners have been at work before the CRL raised the issue. We've been at work for the last six years in engaging one another to try and find solutions. And what we've come up with is that we've registered the, the first professional body for pastors in South Africa and some tell me globally as well. There is no professional body for pastors anywhere in the world. So we've just registered the first professional body for pastors. And one of the things that we have in, in 
the organization is called the Association of Christian Religious Practitioners, ACRP. But one of the things that we've done is that we've developed a code of conduct. Uh, we, we, are, we are licensed with SACWA to, we've developed a framework, so we, we're licensed to, uh, to give this accredited framework to any church that wants it. Uh, the code of conduct is there for our members because we're just starting out. Um, we are hoping that the code of conduct would help to, to, to guide and to provide some guidance. But alongside what we have done, we've also had some of our other partners from the, from the University of Stellenbosch develop the Religious Bill of Rights, um, which is also available and which, which we are also making available to churches as well to, to sign and to, and to enter into. Uh, but I'm saying all of that just simply to say that the church in South Africa hasn't been silent. Dr. Matole, myself, and others have been engaged with the CRL for, for a number of years now on, on some of these issues. But we haven't been silent. We're working very hard on developing modules and modalities for self-regulation. Um, the only challenge is buy-in. Uh, a, a lot of the people on the periphery still don't want to buy into it because they still like to, to do their own thing. Uh, just a case, a case in point is, is, is one of the big churches that's led by a very prominent prophet. Um, when I, I met with him a few weeks ago, and, and his response to all of this was, who are you to tell us what to do? And that's unfortunately the sentiment that we encounter every now and again. And, and he's, he's one of the big ones. Uh, I mean, he fills up F&B Stadium just with his members. Um, but that's the challenge that we, that we have. But all of that just to say that we do have things in place. Um, and our challenge is just to get the word out there and just to try and get as many people involved, those that are not part of a denomination, that are not part of, of, of a network, to get them involved and to avail themselves of, of, that, of the systems that have been created that are available to address some of these challenges. Thanks. Thank you so much. Would you like to take more questions? Um, new questions? All right, I've got a, I also, you before I get missed, <laughs> I just want to ask you, um, before I ask, uh, continue with my question, um, is, is there any help to start a pastor's union? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Because yes, we don't have a union for pastors. <laughs> so, all right, I just want to ask, in terms of our discussion here and what the professor said, um, I just want to ask, how do we get to the point, because we've got so much emphasis and focus on the ministry of the prophet, the apostle, the pastor, and the evangelist. How do we help the teacher to escalate it to get the right balance because the church if you focus just on those four that I'm saying we operate from an abnormal situation and we can only become normal if there's proper recognition across the fivefold and the poor teacher is there there's nobody to help and to assist him he's crying out he stays in the seminary nobody recognizes him and so my question is how do we help the teacher in the fight room. Okay. Go with us. All right, I'm going to start here. Thank you. Thank you to our two excellent presenters. I suspect that um, given the demographic structure of the continent, that 80% uh, of folk that constitute the 600 and something million would be under the age of um, 33. Uh, and uh, this would make this give or take what is referred to as the um, millennials. Uh, those who communicate using emojis, uh, tweets, and, and, and so I, I was listening to the um, to the imperatives, what needs to be done, but reflecting on the generation whose, whose uptake of knowledge and information and the tools within which that knowledge and information, which would apply to theology, which are, is totally different from uh, long written books, the expository, and so on and so forth. How do we bring this imperative 
into a relevance to a generation that doesn't like long, long stories, uh, for whom actually communication is easier through a proclamation. You post your father has died, they click like uh, on, on Twitter, which doesn't mean that they like the fact that your father has died. And for them, that's a commitment. It shows I've engaged. <laughs> or retweet, which means I feel you. Um, you know. The, the, the second one is on regulation. I think that it may be useful to look at how, because this is not a new conversation. Uh, the regulation, for example, on institutions like paralegals that offer legal help but are not legally qualified. Uh, and I dare not say this one, uh, the so-called traditional medical fraternity and its regulation within the broader medical, that's uh, by traditional, I don't just mean African traditional, homeopathy and others, and their regulation within the broader medical professions council. So I've given you law and given you medical professions and journalism, because remember you have uh, Journalists, as we know them, then you have stringers and others that are regulated. May I suggest as a practical step is to engage these constituencies and look at regulation. It has tended to be to take a hybridity, a hybrid form of regulation, whether it's self-regulation, part statutory and part self-regulation, because there will be that ambit of people who refuse to come into the consensual model and yet they perpetrate a lot of criminal and unethical conduct. And you need at that stage to be able, within even a self-regulatory uh, framework, to have a mechanism that grants you relief because there's a sense of collective guilt. One doctor does something wrong, it's an indictment on all doctors. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my name is Pauline Baloi. My question is directed to Dr. Anim. Uh, with regard to African, tra African traditional religion, my question is based on um, when I grew up, I, 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 I used to hear that a woman's place is in the kitchen. And when I look around the, the room, we only 1%, women is only 1% of in this room. So my question is that, how are we going to impact the, the, the generations to come? Looking at the, the vision of E21, how are we going to impact the generation as theological scholars if women are not given that platform to make an impact. Because when we look around here, it's like, especially, okay, let me take Ghana as a country. I think as a woman, when you are given a platform to go and preach, men will never take you serious because you are a woman. So how do we break that barrier to say women are also equal to men when it comes to, you know, uh, 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 teaching and preaching the gospel. Thank you. Okay, uh, greetings to all. My name is Mikateko Shingange. Just raise your voice, please. My name is Mikateko Shingange. I I, I, I think uh, I find this movement as a, a good ground for our theological studies as such. Uh, I want to highlight or, and, or say that can we, can you please uh, through the, as a, glo as a global movement, uh, we have scarcity of Pentecostal scholars. 
So whenever you are busy researching and you want to write something concerning the, the Pentecostal, you find that you don't have such a material, uh, whether in the library or including articles as such. So if we can try to provide uh, other Pentecostal scholars who are there so that when we want to make our research, we find them. I think that's my, uh, I don't know what to call it. Input, thank you. And then another thing, I think on uh, another presentation here, the one which was on the screen, I could see uh, African scholars. I would ask that such African scholars, they do, they be provided so that when we want them, we'll be able to find them and to be able to refer to our own African scholars in our studies because they are scars. Amen. And then another point that I would want to put, uh, I am currently uh, doing my research on the unity, the visible unity of the church in South Africa and racial exclusion. I'm still on, a per on the beginning, struggling with that research. However, I will get there. So, I, on my master's, I found Chen to be saying, we, the Pentecostal, our starting point is on the Pentecost, as a Pentecostal Christian. Then he was talking about uh, traditioning, that we have been slow to traditionalize our doctrine. And it's also a challenge on uh, the next generation it's only a matter of experience, as uh, uh, my lawyer was busy teaching us <laughs> on how we are dealing with these issues of uh, being too much spiritual. So my question would be, uh, do, we, do we have that traditioning ground? Could, could you just sum it up uh, in a way that it, we, uh, we, we give uh, other people a chance because we still have to respond? I, I'm done. I was just asking the question on traditioning. Do we have a, 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 a Pentecostal theology that which has been systematically grounded to say this is what we have? Okay. There's, there's a question here. I'm going to ask that maybe this be the last question because we need to respond to the questions and be done by five. Dr. Shanim and Shona, thank you for your time investing in us. Um, to, I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible to give context to my question. Uh, in Galatians and in Colossians, Paul says there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor free nor slave. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And um, with reference to the passage that Dr. Shona referred to, where Philip, a Jew, was sent to an Ethiopian, an African, to, to provide input into his life in understanding the scripture. With that in, 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 in context, uh, Dr. Animi rightly said that Africa needs to publish, and that's not a new concept. I think that's been 30, 40, 50 years ago um, in the uh, 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 theological um, documentation. It's, it's noted already. And that is a need not just for Africa, but for the rest of the world as well. There's a, looking at South Africa, we are, we are a, a grossly big multicultural and a multiracial society. And we need to learn from each other. An African would look at a person with epilepsy, let's say, and say it's an evil spirit. Where the Western society would look at an epileptic and say he needs a doctor. So we need to learn from each other. How do we and when do we take cross-cultural and cross-racial hands to spring clean our theology and to avoid the mistake of recreating a one-sided theology like a Western colonial theology? How do we integrate Western and African and Asian and Indian theology so we can learn from each other? Yeah, we're going to take the responses. Thank you. Let me start with you, because that is fresh in my mind. <laughs> yes. Um, it is a very important issue that you've raised, and how do we do this? I think to start with, we, some of us came like uh, a few days early, 
uh, the scholars' consultation. What actually happened there was that we were given a theme that we wrote, addressed different, uh, and then we addressed different issues. Uh, I wrote about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ in the African um, culture, an African Pentecostal perspective. Now, at the table were people from different parts of the world. So I brought an Afri African perspective, contextual issues, others did. There were others from America, from Europe, who also engaged with that. Then there were people from the other side of the world, so we also um, did engagement. Now, out of that, we all received some comments, so we need to go back and rework our work. And then this will be made available at the Global Digital, uh, di digital Showcase. So that is one way of doing it. But the point is that normally those kind of discourse is a little bit up. So we need to step it down to the popular level where people can engage with that material. And that is something that I raised here and then we are also working through. So those of you here who are involved in education or have interest, you see, you don't have to be a doctor or a professor before you join this debate. As a matter of fact, theology from below is even more powerful. You know, it, it's a, it is a lived theology, narrative theology. It's all part of it. So it's not something that you just do in a lecture hall or in a, in a classroom. So we are inviting all of us to be part of the conversation. And as we make information available, when you read and you understand something, give feedback, do reviews, and then we'll see how we go from there. So I take your point, and also we also need to listen to different people uh, from different cultural backgrounds, even within the African context. Uh, one group of people that are even lacking more are the Francophone. When it comes to theological issues, literature in French is very difficult to come by. So we need to also work on that. Then my brother here, thank you very much, my brother here, the intergenerational, Kabuka. yeah, Kabuka, you raise a very, very important issue and one that Pentecostals will have to be up and doing. See, Pentecostals are very traditional, more than they are prepared to accept. We talk about the move of the Spirit, which means that we must be ready to respond to the move of the Spirit at any point in time. But when we settle, it's difficult to move us on. You know, uh, if you look at structure, it's heavily, it's, it is heavily male-dominated, right from the pulpit to the, you know. Although we have a huge constituency of women, most Pentecostal churches, women are even more than men, isn't it? So the question is, how do we hear their voice? I'm swinging between you and the lady that made the point there. Yes. So I take your point. Then we have another huge constituency, the youth the millennial group, as you are talking about, the Generation X or whatever you want to call them. But they also come with a culture. I had a shock for myself when my daughter went to the university. Um, when she went, that week she sent me a letter. But it didn't come in the traditional way that I was expecting. Because when I went to school, I wrote my dad a letter. It was an A4 sheet, long one. Then there was even a standard of writing. Dear father, I'm very happy to write you this letter. How are you? You know, rrr, rrr. then you fold it, put a stamp on it, you mail it. Maybe after three weeks, if you're lucky, to get to the other end. But then it's, the time, it's my turn. I said, dad, then I'm receiving a letter from my daughter. It didn't come in the written, listen, it came in a text message. Two words, dad, what's up? And <laughs> for a moment, I was confused. You know, I was saying to myself, this girl, what does she think? Does she think she's my co-equal, you know? <laughs> as, a, as a politician once said. So I had to go through some kind of emotional, to say, oh, hang on a minute, what is happening? My first reaction was that she was not respectful. Then I thought, mm, maybe it is not what I'm thinking. Because see, the generation in which she is now, they are not even using stamps. They are not writing letters in the way they're doing it. So I put myself together and then responded with the test message and then added the emoji, you know, I, just to let you know that I'm on top of it. But I had already, <laughs> <laughs> I had already gone through a crisis. So, <laughs> When I sent it, then within a few seconds, another reply came with a word that I was also not used to. 
He said, ah, it's cool. <laughs> so I said, today be today. <laughs> <laughs> now, the point I'm trying to make here is this. Because I, would, I managed to connect, even though with some difficulty, it opened a channel of communication. So for the four years that she was at the university, I think I received more test messages from her than anybody else. She would keep me in touch with everything. We were friends. But if I had come strong on her, this is not how it's done, you know, trying to analyze it from my time, about 40 years ago, whatever, you know, would have had a challenge. So back to your point, we need to connect with that generation. But it is going to come with some kind of crisis that I think we must prepare ourselves with. Because their way of thinking of doing things, sometimes we can't accommodate them. They are not like the Pentecostal expression and the way we did things 30, 40 years ago. 40 years ago is not here today. And so I take your point, but I just want to say that I recognize it. I am a teacher, but I can tell you I didn't even you know, have it easy. But I've learned the lesson. Uh, at church, I spend more time with the youth and just to make them welcome and to connect with them. Their learning is more relational. And I think when we get there, it should, it should help us and be able to impact that generation. And then back to my sister again, yes, the woman issue, we need to revisit it. What is amazing for me is that Pentecostalism itself in its history, women were very significant from the very beginning, if we know our history. So I can't see at what point the whole thing took a different turn. That the woman's place is where, and some other cultures they say well, when when a man when a woman buys a gun is the man who uses it. Well, I can tell you the women today they buy their own gun and they can shoot. <laughs> oh yes. yes, you know. Now in my seminary, when we uh, were at the university time at the time of the university, we had some women studying with us, and at some point the best students were women in terms of scholarship. They are women. And also in terms of ministry, some of them are also very, very, very effective and efficient. So the whole idea and analysis that put women behind the curtain that is supposed to have been torn, I think we need to rethink through that. I believe that the church would do itself a lot of good if we can encourage the women and let them be where the Lord wants them to be, not where we think they should be. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. How do we get to the point where we are emphasizing the ministry of the teacher? I think that was asked. Uh, I think, again, we need to go back and uh, unpack our theology of the architecture of ministry. Um, I, I think, again, the problem is that we are more enamored with the aesthetics of ministry rather than its uh, divine design. One of the things we teach at our church is divine design. Anything that is designed by God is meant to operate in a certain way. If you violate that design, that thing can't operate. And so if ministry is designed fivefold, you cannot operate the model of God by violating the model of God. And therefore, I think it's important for the church to be taught about the model of God and embrace it. As you cannot embrace a human being by deforming a human being and call it the model of God. So I think it is going back to the, to the, the theology of the art architecture of ministry in the Bible. And that architecture of ministry in the Bible will ultimately also include the role of women, for instance. You know, because if you go through the uh, biblical examples, if you go through the history of the church, you'll find that the architecture of the church that refuses to exclude women the architecture of the genealogy of Jesus refuses to minimize women. And so I think if we are really serious about taking the, the design, divine design and architecture of God, we have to take all of it or we, if we violate a bit of it, we know that we are in violation. In terms of millennials, I think it's important for us to understand that there the, the are levels in which we can engage our society. I, I don't think that all theology should always be pitched at a social level but it should influence at a social level. Uh, I, I, I was arguing with my children the other day uh, about the same exact same discussion, uh, how 
um, uh, in the past. We had all of these scholars, John uh, um, Newton and all of those who knew Latin and Hebrew and what, and, and they said, we don't need to know that anymore now. We, need that we, we want this fast track access to information. But I said, if you, you must also understand that those people who knew more than what is necessary are the foundation of what we know now. And so I think it is important for us to create certain uh, epicenters of people who, need, who, need, who know more than what society needs because they are the engine of ideas. They are the, you know, they are the engines of, co of conceptualization. All of society is not made of pregnant women, but pregnant women make society sustainable. You see? So we cannot want every woman to be pregnant you know, or every man to be pregnant. But however, those who are pregnant actually are important in order for us to sustain society. And so we cannot want everybody to be academic or everybody to be a scholar. However, scholars in their being eccentric are important in sustaining our ability to, to conceptualize, to understand where the world, our world from another dimension. So there's this instructive level which can be a little you know, uh, uh, unique. And then there is this influence level. So we, we have to learn to bridge the two and not necessarily dilute them. Okay? I, uh, you mentioned uh, Tamuka. It's a, you mentioned hybridity. I think it's a good way to go uh, when we can self-regulate but also get government. I think we should get government and not allow government. Get government to be able to uh, assist us in getting other people to be accountable. When we partner with government that way, they will understand we are concerned about their concerns, you know, and we are not just willy-nilly saying leave us uh, alone. Okay, um, I'm not so sure. I think I have uh, uh, covered, uh, I'm not so sure if there's anything else that was left. Okay. Do we have a well-developed African Pentecostal theology? That is the... Yeah, I'm just trying to think what you are thinking. Um, in the sense that, you said you were a theological student, right? All right, are you thinking about it in the sense of like Grudem, systematic theology, and how it's been put together, or what? Yeah. For example, there are some, uh, at the moment, you wouldn't find huge literature in terms of big books, you know, talking about this. But there are a lot of good um, articles and, and publica other publications along Pentecostal theology. And very good ones had come from South Africa. There is somebody called it Chris Inga. I don't know how to present it. What? Chris Inga. He used to be at Uniza, right? Or where? Yeah, I mean, he's done some very good work, um, you know, giving it some African um, perspective. I, I can actually get you a book, you uh, know, so, sorry. Yeah, you mentioned some other names, right? Yeah. There is a book that says Initiation to Theology. All right. I can get you the, the title, you know, and it has a lot of very good material. And there's a section on Pentecostal theology, charismatic theology, that you would find very helpful. And of course, there are other literature as well in terms of um, history. Um, uh, Kinsley Labby's book, uh, Asamoje Do had published quite good. On certain subjects, you have some Pentecostal perspective. You know, I normally write along the side of uh, mission and also issues on anthropology, you know, like marriage, you know. Um, cross-cultural issues uh, from a Pentecostal perspective. So you would find bits and pieces, you know, uh, and put them together. I will make my email available. So uh, those of you who need a follow-up and want some material, uh, as far as I can help, I'll, I'll pipe it to you. Is, is that okay? Yeah. But we are a long way off if you want to look at it in terms of what has been produced in the West. I mean, that is, that is, that is several hundreds <laughs> of years into the thousands. So there are huge material out there. But we can begin from where we are and then also build out something. Uh, and, and also try and understand what has been done ahead and, and, and then use them as well. Is that right? Okay. Thank you.
Well, let's put our hands together for our two presenters.